my name is Justin Stearns. I'm the um, head of the Arab Crossroads Studies program here at NYU AD. And I'd like to thank the Institute for making tonight's event possible. This is the second in a series of three lectures that we're doing this year on new scholarship on the Arabian Peninsula. In the fall, we were lucky enough to have Nehavora come and talk about her book, Impossible Citizens, looking at the Indian middle class in Dubai. And tonight, we're fortunate to have Ahmed Khanna with us. Um, Ahmed Khanna um, got his, as we were just talking about, his BA in psychology from James Madison and went on to get a master's and a PhD in anthropology from Harvard University. And it's uh, serendipitous that we actually have his uh, PhD advisor here in the, in the uh, audience this evening, Steve Caton. Uh, makes it a very small world, it seems. Um, he currently teaches uh, in the Anthropology and International Studies program at the University of the Pacific. And besides his, um, his book, which I've been fortunate enough just to be working through again, a Dubai Sidious Corporation, he has two edited volumes, one of which I have right here called The Superlative City, which is on Dubai and the urban condition in the early 21st century, and the second one of which is called Rethinking Global Urbanism, Comparative Insights from Secondary Cities. He has a large number of articles and talks, but above all, I'd just like to say that what's uh, the original logic behind this series of new scholarship on the Arabian Peninsula came from a, a roundtable in Jadalia, which is an online uh, um, journal on uh, Middle East studies. And when we in Arab Crossroads were putting together a lecture series, we, we really thought that the people who were participating in this roundtable were really providing new ways of, of creatively and productively theorizing and conceptualizing the Arabian Peninsula. And, and Ahmed really jumped out as us, one of those people that we would be very fortunate to have come. So on that note, I'd like to, to welcome Ahmed Khanna. Well, thank you, uh, 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 Justin, for that uh, very gracious introduction. Thank you to Nils and Tarek and uh, NYU Abu Dhabi for the wonderful invitation. It's been really splendid uh, coming back to the Gulf after a few years hiatus. Um, I am going to be giving a talk entitled Gulf Urbanism, the Semantic Field of a Category of Space. It's very much a, a, a work in progress. Uh, it is a, a piece in which I try to think through some, some questions that I've been uh, interested in in recent uh, years uh, and that I haven't really had the chance to uh, rigorously, empirically support. So if you'll forgive me, I'll be asking a lot of questions. I won't be giving too many answers uh, today. Um, I'll be using the concept of a semantic field. It's a concept derived from linguistic anthropology, and it has to do with basically a set of assumptions um, in language and in culture that tend to get organized around a certain uh, arena of uh, inquiry, in this case, urbanism. Uh, so the notion of a semantic field, I hope, is, uh, is not too technical, and I'm happy to elaborate on what I mean by that if that does not become clear um, through the talk. Uh, I'll be happy to elaborate on that in the um, uh, Q&A. In his, uh, uh, so, so let me begin uh, my paper. Um, in his seminal 2004 lecture, Space as a Key Word, David Harvey, the geographer, notes with some frustration that the term space has eventuated in a theoretical crisis in the social sciences. Harvey notes both how recent, how recent the spatial turn has been in the social sciences. He notes, for example, that the term doesn't even appear in Raymond Williams' key uh, and uh, essential Marxist cultural theory text, Key Words. But also, notes Harvey, uh, the application of the term space to empirical research has not produced any clarity or rigor. Harvey finds especially troubling the fact that the term space seems invariably to elicit, to quote, as he puts it, elicit modification and to indicate a, ver a variety of contexts that so inflect matters as to render the meaning of space contingent upon context. The sites where the term is deployed seem infinite, according to Harvey. So what theoretically do we gain, if anything, from the category of space? One notices a similar, if not more pronounced, situation in, uh, in the discourse of, of the urban in the social sciences. And what applies to the urban more generally seems even more acute uh, when we turn to the Arab or Persian Gulf, henceforth, henceforth the Gulf. 
As a specialist on the urbanism of the Gulf region, I've been privileged to be part of some of the more interesting and challenging conversations about urbanism in the Middle East and North Africa region over the past decade and a half. While urban questions have received intermittent and inconsistent attention in the larger Middle East field, the case for the Gulf seems to be strikingly different during the same period, with the urban forming one, if not the, main area of scholarly interest, at least in the social sciences. Nevertheless, and perhaps because the field of Gulf urban studies is both diffuse and, relatively speaking, very much a work in progress, one notices a pronounced case of what Harvey has identified for spatial analysis. Um, those, uh, Justin mentioned a couple of my works, and, and those works I focus on uh, what I roughly, uh, what I very sort of generally call spatial technocrats, architects, real estate agents, project managers, and so on, the intelligentsia of the spatial. And it is to them that I am returning in this paper to talk about this so-called semantic field, which uh, we'll, I will discuss in further detail uh, further on. <clears throat> Can I throw these somewhere? I'll be throwing papers and drinking water, and maybe I'll do a dance eventually. I don't know. Um, so even in 2002, when, the, when I first went to Dubai, to begin my dissertation research, one could not help but be impressed by, this, by the hum of activity the city was undergoing. Every area from shipping to trade to the built environment and to real estate projects seemed to be exploding. Superlatives tumbled from everyone's lips as they struggled to pin down a phenomenon that was very much a moving target. It is no surprise that the urban condition in, this, in the region has become a focus of so much attention uh, in this time period. Any even superficial observer will leap to the conclusion that the cottage industry of urban writing on the Gulf in the first decade and a half of the 21st century is obviously a consequence of the kinds of economic and urban develop development being pursued uh, by the major urban centers of the region. So we seem to be going from the projects, the urban projects, to the scholarship. A recent and very interesting article uh, from an em voices from an Emirati perspective, a view that very much reflects this zeitgeist. In a piece entitled, Gulf Cities Emerge as New Centers of, Arab, of the Arab World, Sultan uh, uh, Saud al-Qasimi, a frequent blogger for the US online daily, The Huffington Post, and uh, often described as a, uh, as a prominent member of the intelligentsia from the Emirates, uh, writes the following, and this is actually not the one I want. Uh, here we are. Uh, over the past few years, as the traditional Arab capitals, Cairo, Beirut, and Baghdad, become more embroiled in civil strife, a set of new, a set of new cities or a new set of cities starts to emerge in the Gulf. Establishing themselves as the new centers of the Arab world, making sure my slide is correct here, yes, uh, 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 establishing themselves as the new centers of the Arab world. Abu Dhabi and its sister emirates of Dubai and Sharjah and the Qatari capital of Doha have developed as the nerve center of contemporary Arab world's culture, commerce, design, architecture, art, and academia, attracting hundreds of thousands of Arab immigrants, including academics, businessmen, journalists, athletes, entrepreneurs, medical professionals, uh, and so on. While these Gulf cities may be unable to compete with their Arab peers in terms of political dynamism, in almost every other sense, they have far outstripped their sister cities in North Africa and the Levant. This construction of the Gulf city as a forward-looking crossroads of culture was in fact so typical of how people talked about Dubai during my field work, which uh, occurred over the years 2002 to 2007 primarily, a uh, period of about a year and a half. Uh, this occurred so frequently uh, in those, discord, in those uh, conversations I had with my interlocutors in Dubai, and also in what I've witnessed in the media coverage since uh, 2007, that one is reminded about uh, the old cliche of the lady protesting too much. Indeed, in this construction, uh, we seem to be uh, having, having a, a what, what Claude Lévi-Strauss, the anthropologist, would uh, call a text, uh, an authorless text in a way. There's this sort of or text from which people are quoting all the time to structure their experience of urbanism. 
Um, and this is, uh, I think that this, this, this is a discursive construction of the city, and I believe it's deployed in situations, uh, among other things, where political questions come to the fore and start causing some anxiety. To adapt a phrase from another anthropologist, James Ferguson, the city seems to become an anti-politics in the Gulf. So in this paper, I will try to do two things. First, I will try to invert the common sense notion that the explosion of urban knowledge production in the Gulf over the past 15 years is merely a consequence of the urban projects that have been undertaken uh, during this time. This assumption betrays a, a, a naive realism that goes from the referent to the sign, a theory of signification that linguistic anthropology long ago advanced beyond. Rather, I will try to show that the situation is more complex and may in fact be the reverse, that to extend the, that to extend the linguistic analogy, the sign, city, and the semantic field in which it is situated help to constitute the arena in which certain forms of, of uh, the built environment take shape and certain kinds of urban spaces emerge. The second part of my agenda here has to do with knowledge more specifically. Categories such as the urban and urban space are vague and do not lend themselves to precise analytical interventions. In spite of this, the proliferation of urban studies on the Gulf has tended to assume that such categories are self-evident. But in fact, we need to ask what such categories specifically mean and how they circulate in different contexts. What kinds of analytical work and political work uh, do, they, do they do? As I think is evident from my discussion of this passage, we cannot take such categories at face value. Rather than assuming that we know what the urban or the city refers to, or asking what is a city, which is only apparently an improvement, I think a better way of thinking about urban questions is to ask what does a category such as the city do? And how does it operate in contexts of cultural politics and historiography? Cultural politics I'm more comfortable speaking about, and I know historians here uh, will be able to speak to questions of historiography better than I, so I won't really be addressing historiography so much. Dwelling a bit longer on this passage, uh, we begin to appreciate some assumptions worth noting. For example, it is, no it is noted that the more traditional Arab capitals, quote unquote, may be more politically, that while they may, may be more politically dynamic than the cities of the Gulf, the cities of the Gulf are outpacing these traditional capitals in the areas of culture and development. In other words, we see politics set to one side and culture in the common sense understanding related to the arts rather than to more anthropological notions of culture. So culture and economics on the other side. Politics on one side, culture and economics on the other. Politics, it is implied, is best left to experts or to some other responsible authority. What, after all, it seems to be suggested here, has the political dynamism, uh, the more participatory and quotidian engagement with the political by everyday people in traditional Arab capitals, what has this brought except chaos and misery? Second, and as I will analyze in more detail go, uh, in, uh, go below in the paper, there's an explicit binary here, traditional or traditional Arab versus the Gulf, opposed to each other. A binary that has proven highly useful in highlighting the ways in which the Gulf is seen to be superior to the rest of the Arab region. Third, the formulation also begs the question, to whom does the city belong? Uh, here it is said that uh, here, and this is a very typical uh, writing, this is in a way an authorless text, what post-structuralists call an authorless text in a way. Uh, it's such a common formulation. Uh, the assumption here, the formulation seems to suggest quite explicitly that the Gulf City is a city for professionals. The Gulf City as the, quote, nerve center for, of the contemporary Arab world's culture, commerce, design, architecture, art, academia, etc., etc., etc. Yours truly, us truly, um, uh, and so on. One might call these us the good subjects of neoliberalism or good subjects of some other kind. Who gets excluded is obvious. The majority of the population who look after the children of these good subjects, who drive them around, who build and clean their houses, who build the roads, etc., etc., etc. 
uh, there's a huge exclusion going on here. There's yet another exclusion that is also worth noting. I, I do this, I, 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 this drives my students crazy. I take three sentences and I write 30 pages about them. And so please forgive me for reading this so closely. But I think it's really fascinating as it's a, a very articulate expression of the, as I'm calling it, zeitgeist or the text of the urban. Um, so the, uh, there's another exclusion going on. The implication that Gulf cities are politically quiescent which may, may align with some Western media stereotypes about wealthy sheikhs buying their subjects' loyalty with petrodollars and handouts. But even a superficial glance at the events of the Arab uprisings, let alone a serious engagement with the history of the past century in the region, easily undermines the assumption. How are we, reconcile this, uh, how are we to reconcile the stereotypical representation of, of politically quiescent Gulf cities, for example, with the recent protests and encounters across the region. Moreover, why assume that the category of politics is an activity that only citizens of a state participate in? Why exclude non-citizens? Protests by non-citizens have been going on for a long time, and the United Arab Emirates is, the, is not an exception. The demands of non-citizens and citizens may be different, but calls for reform along with the day-to-day -day politics of protests, worker militancy, and urban unrest have been a regular feature of Gulf life for a long time, as has been detailed by the work of uh, Robert Vitalis, Fred Halliday, Christopher Davidson, many, many people. Remaining here, I'm going to add another aspect here, um, uh, which is uh, uh, implied by a passage such as uh, there's a com what, uh, what's, what's going on here is, is the, the, the term city and the term state, the term emirate and the term city are used almost interchangeably. There's this sort of um, tacking back and forth. And um, uh, this is also interesting to me. Uh, it, it may seem like common sense to consider Dubai a city or an emirate or a city state, but in fact, uh, are we referring to the same thing when we talk about the state and the city? Um, this is not an easy question. This is a complicated question. When do we refer to Dubai the Emirate or Abu Dhabi the Emirate? When do we refer to Dubai the state, or Abu Dhabi the state, Abu Dhabi the city, etc.? Uh, are they this, are these categories the same? Are they overlapping in some ways? Uh, are they referring to different things? And this is a, uh, something I was really I've been struggling with myself. Um, the the book that Justin mentioned, the yellow one, is one in which I really uh, couldn't figure out what I was referring to ultimately, um, and, and and I really gave up. I threw my hands up in the air. Um, so I think there's a vagueness in the way that we use the category of the urban when we write about the Gulf, and that this is conditioned by our situation as we produce knowledge. Let me discuss some other examples, uh, move on from, from this one, uh, before offering some tentative conclusions. Uh, I've talked about this elsewhere, a short piece coming out in the International Journal of Middle East Studies um, and in other places. Um, I find expert settings, such as academic and professional conferences, writings and imagings, of, of, and imagings on and of Gulf urbanism, to be a fascinating kind of field site and archive for the study of knowledge production, and specifically the schemas and systems of assumptions that we specialists employ in our analytical work, our semantic field, if you will. Uh, I explored this uh, in, in relation to uh, so-called star architects, star architects um, in the UAE in uh, the yellow book, the first book. Um, and I also talked about, uh, there seems to be this uh, the idea, I only talk about Rahim Kolhas and Zaha Hadid. I don't, in fact, I write mostly about people who are much, much more uh, less well-known people, everyday people, everyday architects who are really, uh, again, borrowing from texts of the urban as they um, go about making place um, uh, in, 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 in Dubai. So I argued that in the context of the contemporary Gulf, the expert, and especially the Western expert carrying the cachet of Western cultural capital, becomes an important player in local, cultural, and spatial politics. The conventional story told about such actors is that they supply rising Gulf cities and their ambitious monarchs with the prestige and built iconicism necessary for global urban consumption. This is very familiar from the work of David Harvey, Sharon Zook, and Anne-Marie Brodeau, the place wars or uh, urban entrepreneurialism narrative or theory. And while there's much to recommend it, I agree with much of what they say, 
It does, however, tend to represent local actors as somewhat passive recipients of homogenous neoliberalism and Western-style global urban forms. What we see, in fact, is a far more ambiguous situation in which global experts and local actors uh, shape each other's agendas and, in turn, co-constitute Gulf urban space. Uh, as I said, I take uh, so-called uh, star architects as Raim Kolhaus and Zaha Hadid as exemplary of this process, not to argue that they are the most important or the only actors, but uh, because they are so vividly symptomatic of, a, of, a, of these co-constitutions of space. Um, ultimately, what I tried to show in my earlier work was that while these international experts consistently and explicitly seemed to enact the, the uh, uh, consistently and explicitly spoke and wrote about the Gulf as being an unprecedented laboratory, uh, this is Frank Gehry's uh, terminology, a laboratory that allows them to enact their most daring aesthetic projects. In other words, to live the long dream of unfettered architectural formal experimentation in a real world setting. In fact, they unwittingly participated in the politics of legitim legitimization of local structures of power uh, and historiography. While subject to less direct political and economic pressures, more academic attempts to grapple with the, urban, uh, with the urban question in the Gulf are also excellent settings in which to examine our basic assumptions about space, the urban, and knowledge production. One example was a, very, a highly informative and excellent conference uh, I attended in the American University of Kuwait entitled Gulf Cities, Space, Society, and Culture. The conference featured papers ranging over a broad spectrum of issues. In dozens of papers, presenters covered topics such as port cities of the Gulf, debt, capitalism, and land tenure in the Indian Ocean, the quote unquote urban growth machine of the Gulf, corporate transit cities of the Gulf, public works, contested spaces, ethnocratic governmentality, migration and urban commodification, urban rhetoric, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Dozens and dozens of papers. The timing, I'm just making sure I'm within, well within our time. I don't want to go over. Am I okay? Okay, good. The American University of Kuwait abstract begins in a typical way. Quote, the Gulf region ranks among the most urbanized in the world, with an average of 84% of the population living in urban areas and 91% if you exclude Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Iran. The region's distinctly urban identity is a hardly new phenomenon, continues the brochure. For centuries before the advent of oil, the coasts of both sides of the Gulf waters were dotted with prosperous port cities that served as vital entrepot and transnational hubs, dotted uh, uh, transnational hubs within the Indian Ocean network, uh, nodes of cultural exchange, uh, much like the skyscraper cities of the 21st century, end quote. The introduction goes on to note that a rigorous scholarly focus has been largely missing in the literature on the region and that its urban histories and rapid contemporary urban growth invite new and exciting research. And I think that this is a very good. I think I agree with everything that's being said here, actually. I don't uh, find, I'm not mocking or minimizing or critiquing here. I'm just uh, trying to uh, dig deeper to look at what the shared set of assumptions are between different constructions of Gulf urbanism. Um, so, so what I'm saying is that in spite of the apparent variety of the topics covered by conferences such as uh, AUK, American University of Kuwait, uh, some intriguing patterns emerge and point in a direction, in the direction of a potential semantic field of the urban in the region. Let us consider, for example, how this scholarship is mediated. How, the, how its object of study is represented and what techniques are employed to represent its, this object. Maps, both representational and non-representational. Geographers make this distinction between representational maps, which are with which we're more familiar, sort of the Rand McNally, the Mercator projection, or maps of demographic figures, for example, on the one side, and non-representational maps, which, which track more ambiguous sort of phenomena, moods, placemaking, collective histories, and so on. So uh, uh, representational maps and non-representational maps are central in this conference and in every uh, meeting that I've attended, every meeting I've, uh, or many of the meetings I attended with experts during my field research. Representational maps depicting such things as urban plans, neighborhoods, demographics, and other kinds of data produced an image of the city as a specific kind of object of expertise. 
This was an image of the city as an, either as an arena of surgical intervention or as a demographic research problem or as a spatial relation between built forms. But it was non-representational mapping uh, that was particularly interesting in this instance. The given city or urban space represented as a space associated with qualities more ambiguous or complex than can be captured by a representational map. For example, the city as a space evoking a certain mood or a kind of memory. Such papers describe the passing of certain kinds of urbanity, such as, the city, such as a city in which public parks and accessible spaces were common and its replacement by a skyscraper city. Other papers discuss the aesthetics of public monuments. The aesthetics of public monuments and their connections to collective memories. Yet others evoked even deeper histories and memories of urbanity, such as those connected to the pre-oil Indian Ocean region or to frontier cultures in, uh, pre in early oil cities. Such non-representational geographies can refer to a past, but they can also refer to a future or to a utopia. The most vivid example from this particular instance, the AUK conference, was the silhouette image on the conference brochure's cover and its logo. A blending of the shadows of iconic skyscrapers from the region's major cities, Doha, Dubai, etc., to create the image of an overwhelming high-rise urbanity. In the foreground, it shows a gray silhouette referencing these cities specifically. In the background, a lighter gray shadow uh, of more anonymous buildings. The effect is a kind of Manhattan-like high modernism, an image resonant with a sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle teleology underpinning contemporary contemporary discourses on Gulf urbanism. There have been some attempts to render the reality of Gulf urbanism more theoretically compelling from the frankly dismissive, such as the writings of Mike Davis and David Harvey and other lesser well-known uh, people, to uh, much better attempts, uh, such as uh, Beauregard, uh, Le Renard, and Stadnitsky, Nalida Fukaro's recent edited volume with uh, comparative studies of South Asia, Middle East, and Africa, the work of Farah al naqib I mean, there's many others who are really working on this. Pascal Menoré, whom we talked about earlier. Um, uh, the, 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 the group of scholars I just mentioned are, are uh, producing, indeed, theoretically quite compelling work, but little uh, attention has been paid to the, what I've been calling the semantic field or the tacit basic assumptions that are shared across discourses of the Gulf. And I think that an anthropological perspective is well equipped to address the question. Uh, without hopefully sounding simplistic, I would like to ask a seemingly simple question. What, again, what do we mean by the city in the context of the Gulf? Um, and I'm, I know for those who know anything about anthropology, I'm, I'm dredging up the awful and horrid ancient history of anthropology here. Talking, I'm talking about semantic fields and binary schemas. This is uh, not very fashionable stuff, but I think it's useful as a, as a, as a, uh, a, pr a preface or a first step to moving on to a more interesting theoretical um, stage. So uh, we seem to see in these uh, uh, constructions, the ones I mentioned earlier in the paper and this one here, uh, a set of binary schemas, a, a sort of binary schema um, that makes these sort of oppositions um, here, GCC, Gulf urbanism, global, cosmopolitan, rulers, experts, consultants, professionals, uh, on one side, and then others, the others, right? Yemen, Iraq, Iran, Egypt, Cairo, Beirut, the Levant, um, uh, uh, et cetera, the parochialism, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, everyday people on one side. And um, one, one of the more interesting ones we seem to see, one of the most inter more interesting aspects of this w that we seem to notice is that there is sort of agency on one side, active, participation on one side, construction, and then passivity is assumed to prevail on the other side. Um, and even in the literature on um, worker protests, for example, you notice a, a certain orientalist uh, 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 impulse to try to, to look at these uh, protests as, you know, these are uh, you know, modern day slaves, these are passive people, they, they're sort of, they need people to speak for them and so on and so forth. So you see this really all over the place, this binary. It's a sort of a, a very common, or what I'm calling a schema, basically. 
Um, okay, so of course, if we read this as a schema, we have to ask in what context is this applied? Um, uh, you know, how, you know, how is this code codified? Or how is this semantic field, how does it circulate? And that's the big question, really, that is the next, the one I don't have as many good answers for. But I'll try to venture some generalizations and hopefully useful generalizations as a, as a departure point for a future uh, more contextually sensitive research. Um, my strong sense is that the category of the city has become central in state and capitalist projects, both ideological and discursive in the Gulf over the past 15 to 20 years, if not longer. And I think Pascal Menore's work, uh, to return to it, talks about people like Doxiades in Saudi Arabia and you know, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait in some ways as precursors to this kind of discourse uh, way before the Emirates and, and Qatar uh, have engaged in it. Uh, and so uh, in, in the more recent Qatari, especially in UAE discourses, we see the city um, as central, the category of the city as central to various kinds of political projects. Although the Gulf, of course, has been part of global political and symbolic economies for much longer, uh, it's really only since the 1990s that we noticed uh, uh, people speaking about a certain kind of neoliberal cosmopolitanism very, very vociferously. Um, reinforcing this idea uh, have been various urban economic projects from prestige to iconic built environments, special economic zones, and other enclave developments, knowledge villages, university cities, collaborations with US, foreign, uh, US higher education, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Running through and organizing much, if not all, much of, a lot of, all of this is the red, a red thread, the category of the city. The Gulf, we are very often told, is an urban region. Conferences, as I have mentioned, and symposia proliferate during this period and, and perhaps unconsciously deploy the same symbolic pattern which I've been schematizing here. The city as an object of knowledge, it stands for cosmopolitanism. It is a space to whose production and on whose behalf only experts under the aegis of leaders are entitled to act and to speak. It stands against the so-called non-modern Middle East and North Africa. It is afflicted with problems lending themselves to uh, expert solutions, the demographic imbalance, for example, uh, and uh, uh, others uh, that I shall discuss uh, in, in a few moments. Moreover, what are we to make of the fact that such conversations tend to occur in highly, in highly sort of professional environments, in the seminar rooms and auditoriums of Gulf universities, uh, increasingly operating, whether officially or unofficially, under Western, particularly American, for-profit paradigms. I did not write this about NYU, by the way. I, I wrote this way before I came to NYU. I had, actually, Georgetown University in mind. Under the paradigm of Western, particularly American for-profit paradigms, along with local structures of patron-client relations. Uh, and uh, you know, what, as I've written elsewhere, what kind of knowledge object is being produced in this context? Is it one that highlights and naturalizes, for example, consumption of global commodities as a source of well-being? Or one in which rights discourses organize and contain or contain the politics of labor? Or one that closes off possibilities for alternative modes of urbanism and so on? Who invokes the city? In what context? And how are, how are these actors framing and transforming reality by this? Does it matter that a region long stereotyped as archaic, quote unquote, or Bedouin, is suddenly stereotyped as hypermodern and uh, super urban? What kinds of legitimacy are confirmed by urbanizing, spatializing the Gulf in this way? The political theorist Timothy Mitchell proposes a useful formulation in his justly celebrated recent book, Carbon Democracy, referring to what he calls, quote, logics of distribution. Mitchell advocates a non-referential approach to categories such as democracy or the economy. Rather than simply describing reality out there, such categories act to carve up the world, to frame it as an object of specific kinds of intervention. The boundaries, uh, so the boundaries such categories deploy function to demarcate, he writes, quote, certain areas as matters of public concern subject to popular decision while establishing other fields to be administered under alternative methods of control. For example, governmental practice can demarcate a private sphere governed by the rules of property, a natural world governed by the laws of nature, or markets governed by principles of economics. 
Democratic struggles, he continues, become a battle over the distribution of issues. Attempting to establish as matters of public concern questions that others claim as private or ruled by the laws of the market, end quote. Applying Mitchell's insight to the example of Gulf urbanism just cited highlights the fact that the question of the urban and the Gulf operates as a kind of logic of distribution, organizing political and intellectual perceptions of, interventions into, and analytical approaches to many other issues, from modernity to labor to heritage to national, ethnic, gender, and normative urban identities, and of course, to material resources. And as an illustration of, of uh, what I'm talking about here, my, my, my drawing on Mitchell, let me shift, uh, let me shift gears slightly uh, and talk in a, an undeveloped way, admittedly, uh, about uh, the issue of the so-called Anthropocene, which has been uh, gaining some interest in anthropological circles and, of course, in natural scientific circles for some time. The Anthropocene. Uh, the uh, study of the impacts of human ecological activities, uh, of human activities on eco eco the ecology and the environment at various scales of analysis. This suggests, I think, another fascinating implication of this approach I'm proposing to Gulf urbanism. Um, and alerts us to the ways that such a, a semantic field can shape and limit spatial knowledges and discourses in the region. That cities are major, the, the cities anywhere are major energy consumers and carbon emitters, and that the Gulf, uh, and especially uh, uh, the UAE and Qatar, are very high per capita energy consumers. These are well known facts. Moreover, the idea of economic growth itself emerges in the form in which we are familiar only in the middle 20th century, as the Arab or and as the Persian Arab Gulf uh, extraction states enter the U.S. dominated post-war order. Indeed, um, growth is dependent, growth as we know it, is dependent on this entry. The notion that the economy is something that has the capacity for theoretically infinite growth is obviously a contested one. And as Mitchell has shown, these contestations themselves correlate with the rise of neoliberalism. Nevertheless, Growth is both an idea that continues to underpin authoritative state discourses and governmental projects into the 21st century, and one that aligns well with much deeper Western Protestant assumptions about the separation between the human and the natural. These are assumptions that, with the rise of the US imperial project, come in turn to inform the development agendas and governmentalities of very different states and societies. The category of the Anthropocene seems to take particular salience in this, let us call it period of late growth capitalism, in which a discursive field is beginning to arrange itself around as yet inchoate alternatives to the fuel economy of infinite growth. As uh, my colleague, uh, the anthropologist Amelia Moore puts it, she's a, a scholar of the anthropology of the Anthropocene. As she has put it, the Anthropocene refers, quote, to the pervasive influence of human activities on planetary systems and biochemical processes. Devised by Earth scientists, the term is poised to formally end the Holocene as the geological categorization for Earth's recent past, present, and indefinite future. Uh, the Gulf region has often been described as a place, this is, I'm, uh, so I'm ending Moore's quote here, and now this is me again. The Arab Gulf region has often been described as a place where urbanism takes no account of the Earth's depleting resources and the environmental damage that is caused by intensive oil consumption. Whether this is accurate or a stereotype, in my sense that it's somewhere in between, it is incorrect to assume that we can extract the Gulf from the discourse of the Anthropocene. Even in the early 2000s, uh, local concerns were often voiced in the media and by my own anthropological research interlocutors about what the kinds of urbanism in the region meant for the environment, both locally and globally. Like many Americans to whom I talked, Gulf people often expressed feeling torn between the impersonal forces that have shaped the societies in which they lead their lives and their own desires for what they also called sustainability. The discourse of sustainability, of course, is highly problematical and rather conveniently aligned with neoliberal logics. This is a topic that has received a great deal of attention and I, can't, I don't have space to discuss it here. But what I would like to, uh, to do here is to raise a more discreet issue, uh, again, as an invitation for future research. I return to the earlier passage I quoted 
here. Uh, and to its, to its explicit statement that the Gulf is, is the nerve center of, contemporary, uh, of the contemporary Arab world's culture, commerce, design, architecture, attracting hundreds of thousands of uh, professional uh, immigrants. Um, and I'm, I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that if we think of the Gulf as engaged in, in anthropo, anthropo, anthropocentric, the Anthropocene, not anthropocentric, the Anthropocene, uh, I think this, returning to this, uh, adds uh, a new dimension to our analysis. Um, it's, it's establishing the conditions by which the Gulf is seen as a city of neoliberal professionals, uh, I think delimits uh, the engagement uh, we can we can with with the questions that are posed by the Anthropocene moment. In so privileging the neoliberal professional and expert, what sorts of engagements with this question are made thinkable, and what are made far less likely thinkable? What productive avenues for new kinds of urbanism are anticipated? For example, by Norman Foster's muster, should it ever be completed? And I'll be going there tomorrow. To I'm very much looking forward to seeing it for the first time tomorrow. Uh, by this uh, project and by the other less celebrated interventions into the problem of ecological impacts that occur uh, in various parts of the region. Here, let me again cite my colleague anthropologist a Amelia Moore. She writes, I would, like to concern, I would like to caution against potentially unhelpful uses of the Anthropocene idea. The term should not become a brand signifying uh, a style of research. It should not gloss over uh, rigid solidifications of time, space, the human, or life. We should not celebrate creativity in the Anthropocene while ignoring instances of stark social differentiation and capital accumulation, just as we should not focus on Anthropocene assemblages as only hegemonic in the oppressive sense." End quote. So does the emergence of this question as both a source of concern and knowledge production in the Gulf avoid or go beyond the temptation to brand, to which this notion, as Moore, I, I think, correctly points out, is all too susceptible. Are Gulf engagements posing fresh and productive responses to the rigid solidifications of time, space, and the human and life, or do they simply ignore stark social differentiations and promote the agendas of capital accumulation? On the other hand, again, quoting Moore, we should be cautious with our utilization of this rhetoric surrounding the events in the Anthropocene, recognizing that crisis for some can be turned into multiple forms of opportunity for others." End quote. Representations about the, of the Gulf as symptomatic or symbolic of the apocalyptic telos of capitalism, as exemplified, for example, by Mike Davis's notion of evil paradises, or David Harvey's comment that uh, the urbanism in the region is, quote, criminally absurd, I think should be avoided. These kinds of rhetoric, I think, traffic in the kind of crisis discourse identified by Moore as a, uh, not a very productive or helpful direction. Um, the Anthropocene as an alibi and the Gulf as a symbol or symptom seem to lend themselves all too well to this kind of crisis rhetoric and, and again, I don't think is very helpful. We should rather see the Gulf very much as engaged in the Anthropocene in ways shaped by its historical legacies of empire, dynastic politics, resource extraction, its own locally inflected versions of global and neoliberal capitalism, as well as the more impersonal factors of its geology and physical geography. We should avoid falling into the trap of employing the Anthropocene uh, as an excuse to exoticize the region or to impose on it a kind of zombie capitalist logic, supposedly predetermined by the past, or worse, by the putative moral character or cultural personality of its peoples, as I think some of this, um, some of this discourse tends to do. The Gulf remains a marginalized, even fashion, unfashionable area, area of research in uh, the West, at least the Western Middle East Academy. In spite of, or maybe because of, this marginality, the region offers an interesting vantage point for reflecting on the production of knowledge about generally ignored questions, such as those pertaining to the related arenas of the urban and the Anthropocene. Every discipline is organized uh, around both the legitimacy and prestige of its objects of knowledge, which in turn constitute the precondition of the given discipline's process of knowledge production. The frame of knowledge production casts into relief discourses of the city in the Middle East and particularly in the Gulf uh, over the past decade to two decades. The marginality of both the Gulf, of the Gulf and the question of the urban in the wider Middle East field 
contrasts strikingly with the emphasis on the urban and Gulf studies and invites a number of questions. Why is the urban so central to Gulf studies? How and when does it become so central? How does it organize, focus, and distribute power and resources, historiography and cultural capital, and other arenas of public concern, such as the environment and the Anthropocene? The question of knowledge production also helps us wrap our heads around a seemingly unwieldy and metaphysical question, which I don't think is at all unwieldy or metaphysical. What do we mean when we use the term city, and how does this category operate politically and intellectually? In that, grappling with knowledge production within Gulf cities can help us to clear away a lot of the theoretical morass around the question of urbanism in the social sciences and opens up possibilities for engaging larger questions of urbanism in the global, so in the global south and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>